call the Prince Regional School Committee meeting to order tonight, May 9th, 2017, at 6.03 by my phone. We all know that's right. Okay, we're going to review and approve the minutes of April 6th. I did not get minutes. I didn't April get minutes six. either. Did anybody else get I didn't minutes? Print my minutes? Yeah, they, I think they were sent by email. I did, I, did anybody have a copy of their minutes? Did we get minutes? I didn't get minutes. It wasn't in the packet from Donna. No, it was not. I'm looking at it now. And I didn't or maybe I. Oh, okay. So we don't have it. I think. Is it because of my fault? Well, I think because I we so. had joint committee and there were small committees everywhere and they weren't signed. I don't know what information yeah. I didn't, was sent I, I'm at fault for not signing, so. Okay, so can you just put in the notes that we'll review and approve the minutes of April 6th in June? Moving along. Um, financial statements. Uh, so I, if it's all right with you, Ms. Chair, I'm going to introduce our guest here from Definitely. So uh, at the last committee meeting in not April, the month before, March, uh, we came to you uh, with our recommendation for our OPEB trust. We chose Bartholomew and Company. Um, and as a courtesy, we you asked if they could come in and speak to you directly. So tonight we have Chuck Patterson, who is our senior vice president at Bartholomew, and Brian Jamroz, our uh, vice president. And I'm going to turn it over to them to present to you uh, how our how they're going to put our OPUB money to work for us. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That sounds good. What kind of? I don't know what to do with it. Oh, God. The, 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 I, I get frightened just thinking of that photo. Oh, it's scary. Not be completed. That's how we know he's alive. <laughs> well, thank you guys very much for uh, letting us come out tonight and uh, be part of your meeting. Patty said I could take about 15, 20 minutes to a presentation on uh, what we what we do, and then we can open up to Q and A as much as you need. So, does that sound good to everybody? Sure. Uh, so first of all, as um, Patty said, I'm Brian Jimros and this is Chuck Patterson. Um, we're from Bartholomew and Company. Um, as of uh, April 30th, 2017, we manage about 1.6 billion assets under management. I'm going to take you through various tabs so you know where the information is. I'm going to kind of give you a high level, but there's more nuts and bolts or more of the details, if you'd like, for those detailed type of personalities. Uh, so if you could turn to tab one kind of guide you along the way on the green booklet. Um, assets under management as of April 30th, as I said, we're a $1.6 billion company. Uh, assets under management for the municipal entities is about $964 million. Uh, that represents about 200 plus municipal entities uh, in Massachusetts. We're 115 OPEB accounts in Mass. Uh, that's what that represents. And um, we manage and invest various monies under the Mass General Law, which includes stabilization, trust funds, and scholarships, and other city and town monies. As you can see, we have kind of a niche in the municipal market space. Um, and I'll tell you why that in a minute. Um, if you turn the next page, industry awards on that same tab, uh, it gives for those that like. Uh, we have various independent, uh, excuse me, various awards that were awarded to us, uh, if you want to take a look at that. Um, we're an independent investment advisor on the next tab. I'm kind of just going through this briefly. If you guys have any questions, please stop me along the way if that's okay. Um, we're an independent investment advisory firm centrally located in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, like I said, we deal with 200, uh, 200 plus municipal entities in Mass. Uh, with that, uh, we've being independent, we needed to work with a broker-dealer, with the investment advisor, but we've partnered up with the largest privately held independent broker-dealer, which is Commonwealth Financial Network, 
uh, based right out of here in Waltham, Massachusetts. And that's on this page if you guys want. I'm sorry, going kind of quick. Um, next page over? No, no, first one. Yeah. Uh, Commonwealth Financial Network is our broker dealer. Like I said, they're um, based out of Waltham and San Francisco. Uh, then we are custodian of the funds. Uh, is uh, a subsidiary of Fidelity called National Financial Services, NFS. Uh, that's all in there on this little tab with the, uh, the boxes, just to give you an idea. Um, if you guys could turn to the next page, uh, tab two, the municipal team. I'll give you a little bit about our municipal team. Uh, we kind of have a unique approach. We work together as a team. Uh, the relationship managers include two prior, uh, two previous treasurer collectors, which includes Chuck Patterson. Chuck Patterson uh, was a previous treasurer for the town of Shrewsbury uh, for 14 years. And prior to that, he uh, grew up in the ranks in the city of Worcester. Uh, Dory Ewart, which is part of our team on the relationship team, she was a former treasurer for the town of Princeton, excuse me, Paxton, and then moved her ranks up into the city of Fitchburg. Uh, she's on our team as well. And then we have two previous municipal bankers, which include myself and uh, Michelle uh, Newcomb. So we kind of have a unique team because we rotate and we work together all as a team, just so you know. Um, if you could turn to the municipal team, if you those who like visuals right here, the next page. Um, Tom Bartholomew, who's been in the business since 1981. Uh, he heads up the company. Uh, on the uh, left side is Chuck Patterson uh, and Dory, Michelle, Brian, and Terry. That's the, uh, the relationship managers. Uh, and then Terry is the behind the scenes working through all the details on the journal entries and all the transfers. And she's kind of like the brains behind the scenes, if you will, doing all the paperwork, which we couldn't do it without her. So uh, on the right hand side of that page is our analysts. We have a team of analysts, uh, includes Joshua Paul, Chris Davies. Chris Davies is our money manager. He makes sure that when the cities and towns need money or the regional schools need money, that he's making it and still uh, taking it out of the accounts and making sure we're maximizing the returns, uh, looking at maturities and so forth. Uh, and then we have Alex Bartholomew and Kathleen Kluwaki. So uh, if you guys want on each pages, I won't bore you with all the information, but all of our bios are in there. Um, what our background is and what various uh, licenses we carry or stuff like that. Okay? Um, let's see. I'm going to turn it over to Chuck Patterson. He's going to be talking about um, OPEB, the investment, the mass general laws, and investment policy statements. Uh, thank you for having us in. Um, Tom started the company in 1994, so now we're approaching, you know, 25 years, so it's pretty exciting uh, to have the confidence of so many cities and towns and school districts. Um, my part of the presentation is talk about what is OPEP, how it's going to be invested, and why should it be invested unlike the other funds that you have here in the district. So I draw your attention to tab number three. And I'd ask you to just turn over to one page where it says chap uh, Mass General Laws 30 to be 20. Our understanding is that you have already adopted 30 to be 20 prior to the municipal modernization. Municipal modernization changes a lot of things for cities and towns uh, and districts throughout the Commonwealth, but where you are grandfathered in under the previous statute, uh, it really helps a lot in the sense of how you're going to set up your trust committee, how it can be invested, and so on and so forth. Unlike your other money that the district uh, has, you would have your general fund money, which is very, very safe. Uh, you're going to sit there and invest that with your local banks, making sure that you have FDIC insurance, all maturities are under a year unless it's a bank certificate of deposit. Very, very safe. Matter of fact, I'm writing a cash management uh, policy right now for the Mass Collector Treasurers. And the money is there to be protected to pay regular bills. The next set of monies that a school district would have 
uh, would be your scholarship money. That falls under a totally different statute. Now you're going to take a little bit more risk. Uh, you might be buying some stock uh, very uh, off of what we call the legal list. Uh, I believe there's only about 30 stocks on there, uh, such as McDonald's, General Electric, uh, very, very good blue chip companies here in America. OPEP. Now this is going to be totally uh, different from the way cities and towns here in the Commonwealth and across the country, because OPEP does not just pertain to Massachusetts. Uh, it pertains to all municipal entries, uh, entities across the entire country. Um, and here in Massachusetts, we have what they call 203C, which is uh, the prudent investor statute. So now what we're going to do is take that money and put it into the market. You will be taking risk. You will see brokerage statements that come out that see balances go up and down, just like you would in your own 401k, 403b, 457 account. So with that being said, if you could just turn back one page to a page that looks like this. Okay, certainly cities, towns, and districts have a different understanding of risk. How much risk do you want to take? When we talk about risk, in this case, is how much equity risk are you willing to take? In other words, how much money could you stomach seeing being lost over a period of time? Certainly we know that over long periods of time, the stock market has always gone up. Uh, but there will be times from period to period that the <coughs> markets could go down. So when we look at determining with the treasurer and the business manager, um, how much risk are, is the district willing to take? So how we manage that is by using this chart to say, if you're going to be conservative, you're going to put 35% in equity. And we're going to, when we, when, we say, when we say equity, we're buying individual mutual funds. So daily liquid mutual funds, no different than you would see in the Wall Street Journal every morning. So we would pick out equity mutual funds, large cap, small cap, mid cap, you know, depending on what our goals are for the funds. And so can I just ask you a question about that? Absolutely. If, if, say, one of our goals is not to contribute to companies that are harming the planet and bad for workers and all that. Um, charter schools. Charter schools, yep. the Trump family, yep. things like that. If we don't want to support that. Speak um, for yourself. <coughs> We'll stick right. to charter schools. All right. All right. So to answer that question, um, absolutely. What we would do, and further in here, is an investment policy. The investment policy sets the guidelines that the district, uh, no different uh, than what we have uh, the city of Northampton, uh, they, and I can speak to that because it's been made public and they have voted it. Um, they have chosen to be uh, fossil fuel divested. They don't want anything to do with fossil fuels. Uh, we have churches. We have different organizations that have chosen to be socially responsible in some form. So uh, to your point, we can design an investment portfolio through the investment policy that meets the goals of the committee in the district. We, it is not up to us to dictate that. That is something that the committee would decide and not us. So <coughs> to your point, yes, we can take care of that. One of our uh, regional schools, you know, they don't want to invest in, uh, in this particular case, it's uh, for their trust funds, and they don't want to invest in tobacco, firearms, or uh, alcohol, which I can understand. So we, we just make sure that it's written in the investment policy, and we don't invest in any of those tobacco, firearms, or alcohol <coughs> to, be, uh, to be socially responsible. <coughs> And, and then we'd go uh, with the direction of the committee um, to set up that policy and we will adhere to that whatever that group of people decide. So moving across the risk scale, um, all you're seeing is a change in the equity versus the fixed income. So as, as far as the conservative, you're at 35% equity, 45% uh, fixed income, 20% alternatives. And then all the way out to the uh, far right in this example, you'd have 55% equity, 25% in fixed income, and 20% alternatives. 
So that will then dictate how we're going to put the money to work. What GASB, Governmental Accounting Standards Board, is saying now, uh, they're the ones that came down with this rule that we now have to begin to address this liability of unfunded uh, health and life liabilities. GASB 75 is coming out in 2000, FY 2018. That is going to change how Tom Scanlon is going to um, address the issue on your balance sheet. So that is also going to change. If you remember, you received uh, an actuarial study where they state whether you're going to have uh, a discount rate. A discount rate is the expected interest rate that you're going to receive on this money. So you take how much your liability, you know, plus or minus, you know, with the calculation of your interest rate, that will come up with your annual required contribution. So under the old GASB, there was usually two different discount rates. Now they're going to come up with a blended rate. So once we receive that blended rate, that's going to be where we're going to target how much risk that you you should take. In most cases, we find that an entity should really fall in the moderate to moderate aggressive area. Uh, that way you're taking enough risk to hit that target discount rate. And every 1% change in that discount rate, so if it goes from um, 5 to 4, it's between a 10 to a 15% change in your total liability. Uh, I do not know what the total liability is, but say if it was your liability was $10 million and you were going to earn 1% less, uh, that means that liability would go up to me, uh, up to like $11 million. So it's a big deal on understanding risk and getting the risk situated so that the district can deal with the volatility of risk and then also meet its future goals uh, of this 30-year liability. So that's where we'll sit with the committee, with the treasurer, with the business manager to determine where we're going to land on this risk scale. So just um, to, so that everyone knows, our, our right now our accrued liability is $7,370,000 and it was based on a 4.5% discount rate. So if we are able to increase that discount rate by doing better in the markets, that liability is going to come down. Okay? And certainly the, what GASB is also doing is they're going to give you credit, more credit, for the amount of money that you're putting in. In the past, it was just like a 4.5 number that the actuary had come up with. Now they're going to begin to weight your actual performance versus what you're not putting away. So down the road, it's going to be really, really important to come up with a, a funding schedule and a plan to put money aside. Uh, that's not me speaking. That's you know clearly where the actuaries are going to be coming down on. So I'll try, if you don't mind, uh, if you could, and I'm almost done with my presentation. Um, if you turn to tab four, this runs right into uh, what you have been asking for. I don't think that's a bad value region, but it's okay. Ah. Ah. But there's a school district boy. <laughs> I apologize. Um, and where he's referring to is in the, the header is under Frontier, but uh, there's a block in there that you fill in the, the name of the entity, and I apologize. Can we we did not monies? change that. Yeah. Pardon? Can we use their monies? Since uh, this happened, absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, we vote for that, but okay. you have thank to ask you. them. <laughs> so I apologize for that, but thank you for pointing that out. What this is your investment policy. So as you're, you're seeing, it's going through stating the laws that you're going to follow, Chapter 30 to be 20, under the authority. And then the law that's going to allow you to invest it as a prudent investor, which is 203C. And then it begins to get into the types of investments. And that's where we talk about equities and all the way through. I'd like to draw your attention, a lot of that boilerplate, I'd like to draw your attention to 
tab, um, same tab, page 7 of 9, addendum number 1. And if you recall on the previous section, we talked about that risk. So right in your policy, you're going to be able to look at the policy and we're going to manage that money inside this range. So the minimum in this case here for this example would be our target's going to be 50% equity, but the markets can make it go up or down and we'll manage and rebalance these accounts to stay within that range, keeping the target at 50 for this purpose. Okay. Next tab is just talks about um, all these descriptions uh, come from Morningstar. They are like the consumer report for um, mutual funds. He said Tabby Men page. Sorry, guys. Page, Next page, page. I apologize. Page eight of nine. And then lastly, on nine of nine, that talks about how are you going to measure our performance. So you're going to want benchmarks. And these are a sample of the benchmarks that we will be able to use so that when we come in for meetings on a semi-annual basis, you'll be able to look at how we have done and determine whether we are meeting uh, the goals and objectives set forth by the committee. The very next page is a sample trust document currently under Chapter 32B20 that you have adopted. Um, there is no requirement to have a trust document, but here is one here. Ultimately, we believe that as these funds continue to grow, you will need one, um, and certainly uh, we will work with the district to um, establish one and work with the committee and so on and so forth. So with that, I'll turn it back to Brian, unless you have questions as far as how we would uh, begin to manage the, the funds. My, my question would be... Uh, Philip, keep it clean. Keep it nice. <laughs> I'll shut you down. Thank you. So there. That's what I call a preemptive strike right yeah. there, buddy. And that goes for everybody, but we've kind of already been out of order a smidgen. Okay? We don't care about Mr. Trump here. Uh, uh, I just have a question about the, the, the proposed fee schedule. Yeah. Um, and the, the thing that strikes me, you know, we are a small institution. So going off the bat, off the bat, we are being discriminated against with twice as high fees as a larger institution. 20% versus 40%. The other companies were higher. What's that? The other companies we interviewed were higher. Were higher fees? It was, some of the reasons we chose or found you were the fee, the lower fees, the better interest um, basis points, um, and being able to use our town's monies as uh, an aggregate on which to earn those basis points. Their reporting was cleaner than any other reporting that we could see, and they were the most local, which we think is important as well. 0.4%. percent And actually, if you don't mind, could I interject? Uh, so at the time when I was talking to Patty, uh, we were in the middle of redoing our fee structure, and I quoted uh, you guys 35 basis points. 35 basis points is 35% of 1%. 1% equals 100 basis points, for those that don't know. Um, it's kind of our banking jargon or investment jargon. But uh, we're actually going to, even though the fee structure on the last tab, if that's what you're looking at already, uh, right here says, uh, if you guys could just all turn back to the very last tab, uh, Chapter 7 tab, it uh, has the fee sh uh, structure from zero to one dollar short of six million is 40 bips or basis points, which is 40% uh, of 1% uh, on a million dollars, or excuse me, on $100,000, which is your initial investment, is equal to $400 a year. And that includes all ticket charges, uh, semi-annual reviews, um, rebalancing fees, right across the board, that's all encompassing, no hidden fees at all. The, uh, in that case, on this one, it's 40 basis points. But because I've quoted the school district already, because we're in that awkward, you know, in the middle of restructuring it, you guys will stick and keep the uh, 35 BIPs at uh, $350 a year on that $100,000. So, and as the, uh, 
assets under management increase, we'll stick to that 35 basis points, but it's calculated based on your assets under management. Okay? Uh, and, what, and what Patty was referring to, we understand, for the most part, districts do not have a large sum of money. In most cases, it's usually the municipal entity that has a large sum of money. So we believe that it's still the same taxpayer out there. So if this was part of, say, Deerfield, you'd have the benefit of larger dollars. So we actually discount our pricing schedule for the purpose of giving the larger dollar amount over to the school district when they really should be at a higher level because we look at the total relationship in the community we don't see that it's fair that the taxpayer has to pay more money just because there's a separate school district or water district so as Brian said we will be at 35 basis points Anyone else? My, okay. my question is, if the economy downturns, we're not, we're going to, we're, we're going to lose. And if we've invested it <coughs> into the equities at 45 or 50 percent, our 100,000 could be worth 50, less than 350. Certain, certainly, we all know that 2008 can happen again. Um, we try to structure our investment portfolios to do, and I'm sure you've heard the term, we have lost less than the market. <laughs> Unfortunately, the markets will go down at some point, but and we the, all know that. But there's no guarantee no. thing that's going to, and <coughs> is there any agency or what have you that actually polices what you people do to make sure you don't go out of trust? Okay. Great question. Um, what you have, certainly on the banking side, you have FDIC insurance that they're giving you the guarantee of banking deposits. What we have, and when you go over to tab two, tab one, tab two. You'll see in there that we are regulated by, regulated by the Securities Exchange Commission. So it's going to be this graph here. Tab, tab one, I'm sorry, tab one. Last page. So we are regulated by the Securities Exchange Commission. Our self-regulating body is FINRA. Um, so they are going to make sure that we do, and we have annual audits, Broker Dale has annual audits, we have annual audits by the regulatory body. What we have inside that is SIPIC, Secure, uh, Security and Pro Insurance Protectors Corporation. And what they do is they're going to protect up to $500,000 in cash and securities for any losses. Okay, that's not market value loss. That's if something happens to our entity and we go bankrupt. Um, then there's what they call excess SIPIC coverage, which goes up over uh, up to a billion dollars. And again, that's if we do something wrong. Nothing is going to protect any account for the markets going up or down. If we do something wrong. Um, certainly there's coverage there and then we have errors and omissions uh, insurance uh, I believe it's a million dollars uh, on an incident and ten million dollars overall so there are protections there if we do something wrong but you're not going to have anything that's going to protect you for the market to move up and down so that's why we believe strongly in that investment policy that sets out solid guidelines and then we come to you know, semi-annual meetings to talk about risk. So that everybody understands that, yes, there will be times that we lose value in every one of our accounts, you know, whether it's our home account or these accounts. So in other words, the SIPA coverage, what's the total gross on the SIPA coverage? Um, it's a, SIPIC is a half a million dollars. Yeah. And excess SIPIC coverage, I believe, is a billion dollars. Is a 
billion. So that would protect from something like a burning Madoff taking taking your place over Correct. and Same leaving thing. us in a lurch. And that uh, I'm glad you brought that up, and that's exactly. Um, I don't like to bring up that person uh, in these types of discussions, but thank you. Um, the problem with what happened with Mr. 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 Madoff um, was he never reported those deposits to CIPIC. So all those people never were able to make a claim against CIPIC. He was, in this chart here, he was all of us. He was the rep. He was the broker dealer, and he was the custodian. And he basically told you by his name what he was going to do. Made up. <laughs> You're right. But is there? But how do we know that you were actually going to report the proper thing? And how are we going to find that out so that we don't end up in the lurch? Perfect. Um, your auditor, Tom Scanlon, yeah. when he does the audit, um, he has to look to our bodies, yeah. these other commonwealth, to review what's there. But so when he does an audit, he actually um, gets the information, he gets the brokerage statements. We cannot write up a brokerage statement. Mr. Madoff was doing all of that. So what will end up happening is when Tom comes in to do his audit, he is actually looking at the brokerage statement that is um, calculated and prepared by both national and commonwealth. But the, but the backup behind the, the auditing of the brokerage statements, Tom doesn't do it. Somebody else does that. No, he doesn't. He's going to audit the... He, uh, he, well, he's he going to audit the broker himself? No. No. So what I'm saying is that if somebody fraudulently does the broker statement, do we have any protection? Um, you would have that through a would have that specific and excess. So I'm just trying to ask the right question. No, no, you're, 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 you're down because, the path. You know, a few years ago, that there was a bank locally that went broke because the, the fact that somebody was preparing the statements mm -hmm. and, and submitting the statements to a particular town that he happened to also be the treasurer of. That's why we have the separation. That's Sorry. another reason. We, when I look at the way that their firm is set up, it's sort of like the best audit, the thing the auditor wants to see the most, separation of duties. We have one firm policing us. We have one firm that's representing us. We have another firm that's preparing those brokerage statements. And any time we're talking about 30-year money, we have more time to take a risk. So we can put this $100,000 in a bank that's going to pay us a half a percent, and over 30 years, we may earn $3,000. Or we take a risk. And we may earn thirty thousand, and if the market crashes, lose ten. But we're still up twenty grand. I, I mean, the, that's well, the way but, that we're looking at this. But we might also be at uh, fifty thousand rather than there and the other. So that's you get a chance to, you take when that, you're investing. Right. Yeah, it's a whole. But it's long-term yeah. money. We have the time to to take the risk. And what Paul and I have been looking at is to go moderate or to moderate aggressive. We think that that would be the good range. We don't want to go ultra. Conservative, we don't go on to go ultra aggressive. So we would be recommending that we take the moderate or the aggressive moderate route. So I'd just like to say, and, and Bob, you have really good questions, but I do remember Mr. Scanlon's presentation, and he did say to us uh, that he has in the past found places where something has gone wrong, and he's, he's presented that information mm -hmm. then to the school committee. Um, so, but the um, thing, Bill, is he's only if he's a auditing us, he can determine what our stuff is. Yeah. I want to know that the guy that's auditing them and the information that they're putting out to make sure that that's all up to Hoyle and what the safeguards are so that we know that we're not buying a pig in a poke. Yeah, you ask a great okay. question and I... And just so you know, Mr. Berapizzi, um, before we uh, made our final recommendation, we ran all three presentations through Mr. Scanlon. He came in, we said we looked at MMDT, we looked at PARS, we looked at Bartholomew. This is how we saw where they lined up, and we recommend, we're going to recommend Bartholomew, and he concurred with our decision. But you wouldn't mind us sending Bob over to audit you, though. Right. 
<laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't find anything in our place. Uh, actually, you'd have to go to Nashville. Well, that's a good answer, Bob, right? The, well, they're, they're you, saying, you'd have, yeah. to, you'd have to go to Nashville. We need to vote them as school committee for another three years, so we, have to, we all have to put up with them. So. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the point that I, I'm making there is there's checks and balances. Uh, there's checks and balances, and we are Bartholomew Company. There's Commonwealth. All of the money that the district has will be held way over here at National Financial Service, which is Fidelity. And if Patty or the treasurer needed to, you know, make a phone call, you could actually call up National and say, Hey, how much money do I have over here? So you, the money's here. We are here. So it's, there's that large separation, as you said, with Mr. Madoff, that didn't exist. Right. But are the you, securities are under your name, or the school's name, I should say, not your name. But the financial statements, do you provide us copies of your certified financial statements on an annual basis so that we can do our due diligence to see whether or not what the story is? And actually, you do not get our financial statements. You actually get the financial statements of the broker-dealer. You, and the form that the treasurer will sign is called Form ADV. And in Form ADV, we'll list out the financials of the broker dealer. And it'll because give us we a complete picture. Pardon? It'll give us a complete picture. Mm -hmm. It should, yes. Uh, I have one in the car. And Mr. Scanlon will be reviewing those as part of that. his, his audit. audit. Okay, Bob? Well, I have a lot, a lot of faith in Tom and Tom Jr. I, but but the point is, I just like to ask all the questions because, you know, there's been so many things that have gone haywire uh, across the country and, and particularly the, the Madoffs and, and what have you. And it's happening. The pyramid schemes are still happening. Yes. And I just want to make sure that we ask all the questions and try to do the right due diligence because once we make this mistake, we, we're not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to decide we don't want you next week. Well, for, for the record, I was the treasurer of Town of Shrewsbury, and Tom Sr. was my auditor, so uh, I was trained by the best. So. <laughs> well, I can tell you what, I've spent a lot, a lot of time with Thomas over the years, and I spent about an hour and a half with him about three weeks ago, and uh, we had quite a conversation. We talked about trips back and forth to Boston 25 years ago. So. So if there are right. no other questions, Just one question. Go ahead. Patty, Patty, do you have sort of an internal the, a guideline that was when you would pull an account like this? I mean, did, how many years in a row did the fees have to exceed the return before you decide oh, to change or something and, like and, that? And, Tom, and I will be reviewing that with Tom Scanlon every year because this is important. This is not – this. I look at this as this is – taxpayer money that we've been entrusted with and now we're trying to to alleviate further burden to the taxpayer by investing it wisely so that we'll we will only have to ask less from them in the future so that is absolutely something um, that we will be doing we do that right now with MMDT who has our scholarship accounts as well um, I actually have a question uh, and maybe I missed this, but we're an aggressive moderate. No, we haven't made the decision yet, oh, okay. but we're going to. We're our recommendation is moderate or moderate aggressive. Okay, so is it easy to flip back and forth, or is that something that you get locked into when you, when you uh, do that? Certainly, it's always easier to increase risk. Mm -hmm. So when OPEP started, our first OPEP account came in in 2009, and treasurers were uneasy with risk. So we had. Uh, towns and entities started conservative and gradually move up the risk risk scale. Um, if, if if there's some hesitance, I would definitely clearly. Patty said moderate aggressive, and we recommend that's where you should be. But to put your toe in the water and moderate uh, to just get a feel of risk, then there's nothing wrong with that. And then when we come out every six months. Then we can discuss it. Mm -hmm. If you recall, in um, February, the market had gone down, and we had a couple of treasurers that were in the moderate category, and you know, it was it was a tough time in their account. And we had one treasurer that decided, I don't want to take that much risk. So we actually did take some risk off, and two days later, that was the bottom of the market. The bottom of the market, and she missed the whole upside, uh, or they missed not she they missed the whole upside. So. I would recommend, or we would recommend, uh, always increasing risk than having to go the other way. Thank you. 
but we can go the other way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. So it's any time. Account. And in, any time you want, and to your point, uh, we are hired at will. Um, a letter can come to us, um, or you could send it directly to Commonwealth, for that matter, or national, and transfer, they, they call it a TOA, transfer of assets, mm -hmm. and they could move <coughs> without even communicating with us. So we are totally at will. The only thing that isn't the, the trust is not irrevocable. Once we set up the trust, Correct. that's not that becomes irrevocable. Yes, sir. In terms of reporting, I just want to make it clear. So I heard you say every six months they come report directly to us, and then month year it's as well. So we'll get reports monthly, and then we get we'll get audited. They check in with us every six months, and we get audited once a year. And, and to, to that coming in here, we find that six months um, with all the other committees that we deal with, and there's over 120 OPEP committees at, or towns, we find that that is what you collectively have always wanted. If you said, no, we want to meet on a quarterly basis, we come on quarterly. Um, but there's not things, you're not 30 a month. Uh, it's like your own, uh, you know, 401k. You don't really want to look at that every month or every quarter, uh, so that's why. If, if the committee chose that we want you wanted us here on a quarterly basis, absolutely. Brian can just quickly show you the reporting. Yeah, tab five. A uh, couple of things. So, a broker dealer is going to send you a monthly statement from Commonwealth Financial Network, um, and then what we're going to do is, if you can, on tab five, page two which is kind of the spreadsheet. Now this is designed for the treasurer, the accountant, and the auditor. So there's a lot of detail there. Um, but it's really catering to those you know, three audiences, if you will. Um, this report will actually be coming from us, Bartholomew and Company. And we're gonna make sure you get this report by the fifth business day, or excuse me, yeah, fifth business day of every uh, quarter, if you get quarterly reporting from us, or monthly. Um, a lot of the OPEB uh, customers, they prefer it quarterly just because that's their choice. Uh, but we could do a monthly or a quarterly report from Bartholomew, but you'll, getting, you'll be getting a broker, uh, broker statement on a monthly basis, okay? And in the reporting, it will break down, <clears throat> excuse me, um, just going through some of the tabs, your, your, your beginning principal, beginning earnings, uh, your net earnings for that particular quarter on this particular report uh, or monthly uh, but net earnings what you've earned over that period of time uh, your ending cash value just take a look at the yellow highlights I think that's more important for the treasurer's role if you will the rest of it is designed for the accountant and the auditors but um, the ending cash value and then the ending market value uh, that's all laid out there for you okay anything else on that track or? And that's yes. Distribution of the principal. When can we start tapping it to pay some of our open costs? Go ahead, Seth. Okay. Currently under 32B20. When you read the law, it says that it has to be there to pay for um, health and life for your retirees. Okay. So in theory, and it's not designed that way. In theory, you can make a distribution tomorrow from your OPEP. It's certainly not designed that way. Um, under the new 32B20 uh, that was part of the municipal modernization, there is a full process set forth on how you remove money um, that's in here uh, as far as you know, who votes, the governing body, the governmental... It's more complicated thing. under the it, new statute than it Yeah, but what, I think it sets under. out good guidelines of how it's going to be take, taken out. But you're in most communities are um, in the accumulation phase of the trust. But in theory, you could take it out today. Well, say, for example, that for some reason we couldn't get funding for our whole budget some year. Yes. And could we turn around and come back and say, well, built into our costs is $60,000 or $50,000 to take care of the uh, retired employees health insurance, right? Could we take part of that, what we needed to, to make the rest of the budget work, could we take it out of there for in, that? In theory, yes. Okay. As long as you're paying it for 
the retiree's health insurance, because yeah, that's what the law says, yeah. but certainly that's not the intent. Well, I, but in theory, yes. But, you know, we put the money aside a couple of years ago, and we did it for a reason, because we wanted to start <laughs> doing this. But I'm saying is if we got into a real pinch, and, you know, right now, uh, uh, one particular town locally did not uh, uh, pass an override. All right. Now, that's the elementary. That's not Frontier. But you don't know what's going to happen next year when the budget comes up for Frontier. We may get squeezed, and we may have to find some money. And, and we, I just want to make sure that we're based know, off the what statute, we what we can access statute. or what we can't access. Yes, based off the statutes currently written, certainly it's there. Just so everyone knows, our retiree insurance right now is less than one percent of our total budget. Okay. I'm just you. trying to cover it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for breaking it down. So, anyways, I almost understand this. <laughs> well, just um, I'd ask that you work on getting our name. <laughs> Sorry about that. And your 15-minute estimate was uh, a little off. off I know. By, uh, I know. Yeah. Maybe they're going to drop our fee for that. Yeah. 25 yeah. minutes ago, we can blame on Mr. Duck. That's true. Good point. They could drop that Good fee, point. right? He's on. A, he's on an election. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Great Thank night. you so much. Do you need an extra copy or anything? Uh, or you're good. We got some other members here. Here, so if you were to come to Shrewsbury, I want to see how many years. I was in 14. How many years have you been out here? Just 15 years. So I work for a big county. Why not just to teach school there? That's all. All right. Thank you. I'll have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Patty's just going to walk them out. Hmm? Sure. Um, so, we, it appears we have no public comment unless there are no public comments. That's that. Allison wants to say Student something. advisory has not shown up. So, um, Patty should be right back. And then we'll go on to um, the building. But we're going to just give her a second. So she's going to this way. We can Things out. I know. <clears throat> this is from Mary, but Mary's here. Okay. Did she finish her report? Are you, you going to let her finish? She's coming right now. Yeah, there's a little bit more in there. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to go out of order because you know how you don't like that. I hate it. Thank you. You are so cute. You like this one. You're such a bear. I know. So Patty's not going to finish her report. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Um, so I did send you the um, report, the financial report, uh, earlier uh, in the week. And um, there's two things that have come um, to my attention that we're going to need to cover. One of them um, is the SPED revolving. And I don't have a report on that tonight. But uh, we had a few students that attended part-time instead of full-time so we're down some tuition in that account so we're gonna have to file uh, we're gonna have to find some money to cover that shortage which is about I, I, I don't have a exact figure so I don't want to say anything um, but the second thing I gave you a report tonight on our school lunch program and that's the one that looks like this So if you go down to the through April, we've lost $54,567.81. Last year we lost about a total of $65,000 through for a full through June. Um, this one right here. Okay. I gave it. Give me another one, Bob. You'll find it later. Here you go. Unless Mary snuck off with it. Um, so right now we're about $3,800 from a lot less of a loss than we were at this point last year, but we're also have less service days because we had less snow days last year. Mm -hmm. So we actually served more uh, through last year than we have at this point. So I think we're gonna wind up about the same, at about the same $65,000 loss this year as we experienced last year. So we have to find that money in our account, um, in our budget. So that's my instead of instead of finding money to cover it, what are we doing to not lose sixty five thousand dollars? I guess. I mean, I know there's we've talked about it. I mean, I understand what you're saying. Right. How can we 
you know, so how can we not lose $65,000? So Darius and Dr. Carey have been working this year uh, on this issue. Um, and But I will tell you one thing that DESE has brought to our attention um, is our it, is our participation because we don't uh, rec we l allow our seniors to go out um, out to lunch and I'm not looking to change that it is what it is but that does hurt so can I just say I think it's important for Dr. Carey and Darius to have this year I think that's what we talked about at the end of last year that we have a year to look at um, all options <coughs> um, and then have the presentation at the end so that we can not to table it again to your, your question, but 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 at least to have well, before the end of the year have some kind of thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, we have done things. Uh, for instance, we closed the school store. We added the school store income to the lunch income. We also streamlined a few things in the cafeteria so that there is, I think, supposed to be one less person working on Fridays when there's an early release because the seniors do leave, a lot of them do leave. We've, um, we've started selling some different items and um, introduced wraps and enhanced the environment of the cafeteria. But those, those things really um, have made things a lot nicer, but when, we, when we're looking really at crunching numbers, um, Darius and um, I, have been working and we do have a plan it involves um, you know some things that we you know we just can't talk about in an open meeting at this point but we will have a plan in place for the summer and going into school next year and it will be perhaps a more rigorous and aggressive plan to um, to help cut costs there could, could I make a suggestion that we sort of that you change the way you think about food service um, because we treat it as an education as as part of an educational institution I mean, I see that all the employees are down for their usual 2% raises and I uh, you know if this were a restaurant and you're losing sales you uh, and it, you know, and, and you try a menu makeover and you're still losing sales and the people just aren't eating your food. Your customers are not buying your product. You change your chef. You know why? Because they, we can't make what they want because we have guidelines <coughs> and standards that we have to go by. If we made things that were unhealthy, we probably would have more people participating. Since we're, but, we're making things that probably 30% of the kids don't like or the seniors that are going down to the pizza place or or Subway or something like that. So right now, and Mr. Holla has a point that the Healthy Hungry Kids Act did hurt us. Um, uh, and right now we're, they're pulling back a little bit on that. Um, but other school districts, if you walk into their cafeteria at a high school, it looks like you're at a food court at a mall. That's how you get teenagers to eat. It, it, it's about presentation and in order for us to make that change it would cost money um, but uh, I've been in other school districts where our, our cafeteria at the high school did resemble that so that you have you every day you could choose from pizza healthy pizza but pizza you could have a fresh it was like going to subway you could go to the to the counter for the fresh sandwiches and they, they'd make it to order but that but it it would involve an investment in redesigning the cafeteria, it would be signage. It would be new. Um, I, I don't even know what we call those things, like um, the display cases, all that kind of thing. So yeah, I think a lot of it is the sameness of it, and that, uh, that there are institutions that do three-year contracts with food service directors, with the expectation that it's one and done, and that that the rotation is good for everybody. You get new and different takes on everything, and that. Um, and, and that I, you know, I understand that the people are, are a part of the community, and uh, kids are in school, and all this stuff. But um, they, this is something that chefs, that people with extensive restaurant experience, uh, at a point in their lives when they no longer want, when they have families of their own, and they no longer want to work holidays and weekends, they want to transition to a career like this, and that we should be posting this thing 
every few years. We, uh, yeah, um, we are working on it, and we are um, thinking about some serious steps. So, to, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just got a couple questions because I'm unaware of the, the lunch as it is. Is it just one meal each day? The students have that's their choice. That's it. They have, they, or is there more? No, they have others. They have a choice of <clears throat> a wrap, except on Fridays, and or they have a choice of the um, the hot meal, the entree, or salad bar, and then there's some a la carte things like yogurt and fruit. Um, I think we're serving sherbet now, and then there's different chips and waters that all fall within the guidelines. And the guidelines are lessening now. We can all we can introduce um, instead of whole wheat. Pasta, which is a hard sell, we can now use um, white pasta, and so that's that's going to, to start to help a little bit. Just as, as a general <laughs> concept, so we can start to, to zero in on it. I mean, it looks like starting in October, it's about forty-five hundred dollars a month in the whole. What do you think is the one biggest contributor to that loss each month? Our st we're over. I believe we're overstaffed. If I, I have to do some more uh, drilling down, uh, but our meal per labor hour, I guarantee you, is off the chart. But I have to now, I've got all the payroll records accumulated. Now I have to count how many hours are related to those payroll dollars that you see there. So, and that, the meal per labor hour is a standard industry metric. Um, and what, if we look at our salaries and our costs, we should be at between 70 and 80 percent of our profit. And as you can see, we're well over that. Our, our staffing alone is 109,000, and we and we've only sold 110,000. Your revenue is just covering the right. staff. I can't. We cannot cut down on food costs anymore. Um, have do do seniors have to let you know if they're going to be going off campus? So then the cafeteria people are forced to count them in for the daily meals, even though... They have running estimates. They know how much they sell of each product. It's okay. pretty consistent. Okay. You know, the other question is, have we ever checked into um, grouping with another <coughs> school for ordering things? Or? We do. We, we do. We, 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 do that. we bid through the collaborative. And we're still that far in debt? Well, that's what I'm saying. We can't go any further. We can't go any lower with the food costs. Okay. It's the labor that's got to come down. Okay. All right. Cindy. Yeah. Yes, sir. Could we look into uh, getting an outside contractor to come in and give us a, a, a quote or an RFP, issue an RFP, see what some of these vendors can come up with, and uh, at the same token, at the same time, ask our staff to come up with a, a, a better plan as to how to make the thing self-sufficient as much as possible, because. Uh, you know, we can't continue to, to take the uh, another hit for 60 or some odd thousand, and how much do we rolling over in the, is the deficit already? 57. The prior, how much? Oh, 54 this year. And how much from the prior year? Well, we had to pay it off. I mean, there's nothing carried over. You can't carry it over. You have to yeah, pay it off. We paid it But off. I can tell you right now, there will be no food outside food service vendor that will come in while we still have seniors going out to lunch. They won't even bid it unless they have the entire student population. And Bob, to, to that point, if you could just familiarize yourself with Sodexo and some of their uh, happy customers, because that's that's the vendor in this area. That's oh, Marriott. Oh, Aramark, too. And, and, but, um, and, and the track record with those companies is that they, they offer you a really low price. You, they convince you to shut your cafeteria down, that your town fathers are really happy, and after three years when you no longer have the capacity to do it yourself, your prices start to go up tremendously, and you are helpless. And well, I mean, I, I'm just, we need to do that type of research. And, but when, and then once, once you eliminate your ability to have a food service, you can't ever get it back. Right. I agree. But what I'm trying to say is we've got, a, we've got a deficit this year. We've had one last year. It's not getting any better. <coughs> and, you know, we're barely covering the, the cost of the labor, let alone the cost of food. Well, let's, let's let them take another look at it and then get back to us on it. We, I, I would like to just say, if, if, I, if I'm sure. allowed to, we have, uh, Darius and I have been actively on this issue since October. We have documentation, we have, you know, meetings, and we have done a lot of work on it, and we're, um, 
I think we're ready. And now we brought in Patty, and I think we're just ready to, to do something. And we and we will. I got just one quick one. Yep. Have, have we have we asked the kids what they want? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just. That was serving. I guess because that's where it starts. So. I mean. No, I think uh, you heard Dr. Dr. Terry said we, there's a plan. It's unfortunate the numbers are coming out before the plan. We should be presenting a plan to the numbers at the same time, but it's not time. Are you right. optimistic? <laughs> yeah. Good. Because yeah. you look kind of like. Sorry um, about the numbers, James. Sorry. Mr. Decker asked for them in, so in March. That's all right. I understand. I mean. Oh, I understand. No, I understand. But, you know. Okay. okay. Right, thanks. Before, before, we go, before we go too far on the financial statements and what have you, how much are we overdrawn on going to be short on the special ed revolt? I don't know. I don't have a final figure. Exactly. That's why I said I don't want to say one out loud because I haven't been able to drill it down yet. Okay. But, but so I had to talk with Karen Ferrandino, our special education director, and we do have savings in the tuition accounts um, because we had some kids that were supposed to be headed towards placements that went into lesser cost placements. So we'll be able to use some of the shorter, the overage in the tuition accounts to offset the special education uh, revolving fund. That's the plan. Will it be sufficient? Yes. Yes. Oh, and you had 17 warrants that total one million three hundred and seventy-nine thousand. Three hundred forty-five thousand nine hundred forty-nine dollars and eighteen cents. Thank you, Mr. Holla. Good. Good. All right. Forty-five nine. Um, update on the building exploration subcommittee. One two three. Subcommittee. You're on. Yeah. Um. Oh. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, well. So. The building subcommittee. This article here, Bob Decker brought in. He's on our committee. We met last week. Phil and Bob and Bob Decker were there. So we did not have a quorum. Two of our members were absent. I wasn't but, there, sorry. But we did have um, some interesting talk. And what we have um, done so far, what we've worked on is we have agreed that we're going to spend $900 to move all the filing upstairs, the file cabinets, the boxes, everything that's in the cellar, we're going to move on to the um, ground floor so that it'll be available to really sort through and see what we really need and what we don't need. Um, we have contacted both New England Archive Centers, Center, in Holyoke and King Information Systems in Wilbraham to come in and talk to us about um, digitizing some of our records. Uh, New England Archives came today, seemed to be a little overwhelmed about the amount of stuff that we had to, we, uh, about the amount of detail and just the amount of records that were down there. But they took away some of our um, early um, we have these employment cards, and they're they going to digitize one, one box for us to see how long it would take and how much and give us an estimate. They also estimated that <clears throat> in the file cabinets, it would be $400 per drawer to digitize. So a four-drawer cabinet would be 1600 And we probably have maybe 10. Did you say $400 a drawer? A drawer. And so it's 1600 a four drawer cabinet. That's sight unseen without looking, without opening every drawer. No. Some drawers that have this so, much in through. Yeah, so we need to um, what it, sort, sort, sort it through it. And <laughs> <laughs> the problem will be it takes a lot of time to, I agree. because some of these employment folders are huge and the people, <coughs> God bless them, have deceased. <coughs> They're gone. They, they don't even live anymore. So I think we could get rid of those files. So somebody needs to kind of spend the time to purge. Um, and so then I met today with the four town administrators from the four towns. Lovely group, great group. We have some really good conversations. And <clears throat> Sunderland is using King Information Systems from Wilbraham because they're um, digitizing and going through, and they're doing some records management too in Sunderland. It's just a huge, a huge task. Uh, Deerfield is also interested, and so they asked me if 
maybe we could do, you know, an RFP, like would they give us a discount, like the school and the two municipalities. And so I'm going to see if that could, if they could, if we could work something out with them. Although they haven't called us back and come yet, but New England Archives did. They're working in Shootsbury. Um, on top of that, we um, have also contacted the Waitley School Building, the Waitley Town Offices. I've asked Brian Domina uh, how much it would cost for 1,000 square foot, uh, square feet of storage. So even if we don't go through and digitize and pay 16, 20,000 to digitize, if we still want to continue to store, which we still have to store certain things, um, agendas, uh, school committee notes, we we uh, we asked for about a thousand square feet in their town office building, and so he's going to get us a price on that that we could just move a lot of our stuff there. So we're working on those pieces, and Bob can talk to you a little bit about the underground tank. Is there anybody working on that? Right now? Christian Lane? Yeah. No, Bob. Um, there's two cars there almost yep. every day. Two cars. They, there's a rental property today across the street, three, and they three, use today it was as three. a parking lot. Oh, well, well we were over there today. No, this was early this morning before you anybody was there. There's a rental. The the what the rent the house. People on the corner. On the corner is a rental yeah, unit. That, that didn't even down. They got there all the time. I go. What, what they used to park there when we were there too. And they were a little bit of a problem for snow removal, but now it actually makes it look like there's somebody mm -hmm. gambling. Right. Okay. Thanks. Um, um, underground tank. The underground tank. We've got a 2,000 gallon tank there that was abandoned about eight years ago. Um, I don't have any record show it link. It's very difficult to say, but <coughs> um, the reason that I'm hearing that it's abandoned is the water showing up. Um, I've had, I've called four people to look at it. Um, two have responded. There's been a huge, there's a huge disparity in the two prices I have. I honestly feel the lower price I have is a good price. Um, so we're going to move ahead and pull that tank out. Um, I've got a price of 4200 and I've got a price of $11,250. Um, both prices have a very specific caveat that if there's gross contamination of the soil and there's soil removal and testing, that'll be over and above the removal costs. The standard procedure for that is contractor shows up on the site, opens the tank, but in no, you know, exposes the tank, but in no way moves it or disturbs it, calls the local fire authority, they come and take a look at it and say go or no go. So I'm hoping we'll be able to schedule that in the next four to six weeks and get that done and get that liability so off of there. Who it is that's going to do the work first? Okay. okay. I have contacted the lawyer um, to see what the contingencies are for having a tax sale. There's some really very old furniture in there, um, office furniture and bookshelves and different things that are just, you know, we we won't we don't need them in our district at this point. But I need to be sure. I uh, we need to be sure if there's any problem with having a tag sale where we could sell them, sell the equipment or uh, trade it in for metal, you know, send it away and get money for metal. And I'll have that answer hopefully by next week's meeting. Um, okay. Cindy. Yes, sir. Come on. I uh, asked the superintendent to make copies for everybody here. This is the school building in, in Wayland, I mean, in Northampton, right. that the City of Northampton uh, had found a buyer uh, to buy it. Okay, I don't think that our building is worth anything near that, but there is some value out there for a building. So my preferred thing would be that the town of Wayley would like to take it all back. Put it back That's together. probably not going to happen, Bob, okay? And the people from Wayley also cast doubt on the vi marketability or commercial viability of the property, and um, you know, the, I, we're going to be lucky to get it, get rid of it for a dollar, and that's a fact. Um, 
Has it, has it, we heard anything else from the, I mean, I wasn't at the last meeting. Have we heard anybody from the else from the collaborative possibly or? Okay. No, but what we did hear today, um, we talked a little bit, there's a lot of talk about senior center and, you know, senior place for seniors to meet. And my understanding is a group from Whiteley went and looked at the building. And a group and they were very in. There was at least 10 people there. One of the, the really large drawback, you know, I think everything else could be taken care of, but it was the um, access to the building. It's not ADA compliant, which is one of the reasons we left. And that really has to be ADA compliant for senior citizens. So that was a problem that, you know, that was just one thing that was mentioned today. It's not ADA compliant. And I don't know how much it would cost to become ADA compliant. Along. Um, further discussion, and we get to vote on the repairs to the Library and Media Center. Ooh, big night, Bob. Yes, it is. I tried to put everything on one sheet. I, I did get a picture on the back of it that is something you haven't seen. It, it, this is the first time we got up and looked at what's the primary source of leaking. It's the area right above where that ceiling panel there is always. And what it is, as you can see, at some point they cut back the metal roof and put a patch in there with a drain that hasn't worked well at all. In, in the summary of stuff, I'm, I'm showing the money we spent so far. Um, the Pope Hartman architect said $5,000. Study of the entire issue. Um, basically, what I'm saying in, in, in all of the options that are here, Tier 1 stops the very active leaks. And that doesn't, and that doesn't and work in the first. To time. some extent, slow down, slow down the flow of water. We, we may have a little bit of leak problems still around the windows here, and we had some little leaks over in the corner that we were always actively chasing. But Tier 1 takes care of those, those big issues. So we've got the thing that I would want to say about doing just Tier 1 and none of the other projects is they all build on one another. Um, and, and they all have an economy of scale. And all of the projects further down the line become very disruptive if we do try to do them individually and a lot less likely to happen. Um, they're all good projects. They've got envelope, energy efficiency, and, and safety components. But basically, if we intend to proceed with anything this summer, we need to make a decision tonight. Um, if we do just tier one, um, time for that, we mean we have to approve approximately $22,000 tonight. Um, and then the figures just kind of add up from there. Tier 1 is remove that patch that I show you a picture of and replace it with a pitched cricket. Um, that will solve that, <coughs> that problem. And then refresh around the entire this area. <coughs> fixes the good story, takes that glazing out, glazes it up, and seals it, and fix that, fixes that window for the long term. Tier 3 is a really good energy upgrade of efficient lighting and insulation and vapor and wind barrier at the ceiling above the library. There's been several questions asked about uh, rebates, and we've identified somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand dollars in rebate money that would be recouped if we do tier three. Tier four is if we if we do do tier three, we're going to create an even colder attic 
than we currently have, and we've got a good deal of mechanical equipment up there. Um, so what Tier 4 is, is creating an enclosure around the mechanical equipment that will protect it from freezing, and then upgrade the uh, temperature controls and the motors and some of the lighting in that space. Tier 5 is a safety thing. Um, it's just a really problematic place to get up there and do service and work. So Tier 5 has money in there to replace the ladder out of the janitor's closet that gets you up there, um, creates a door from the roof to get into the enclosure to greatly simplify that, and creates a catwalk over the new ceiling that allows some access and security up there. And then Tier 6 is once everything's fixed, it really makes sense to begin to fix the carpeting in this space. So basically, what we have tonight is a choice of spending somewhere between twenty-five and three hundred and forty thousand dollars. Now, all this is figured the prevailing wage rates. Yes. On all that stuff. <clears throat> yes. Okay. So, but so if we turned around and voted to incur debt for the tune of not to exceed $400,000 to, to handle all these projects and to pay the debt off over uh, 10 years, that'd be $40,000 $40, a year plus the interest. Uh, we don't have anything else coming down the road that we don't know about? We do. We do. Okay. What? So I mean that's I mean we talked about this last year a little bit that if we there's two angles to go either we continue to chip away at different projects with whatever funding we have or do we go after a, you know a bond or what you know however you know the phrasing on that is um, because we do have a, a list of you know we could come back <coughs> with I don't want to just throw the word million out there but we have a track that needs to be resurfaced and that's on the agenda tonight to talk about um, and there's a lot of other stair treads that need to be replacing that are going to, you know, that are, are reaching a hazardous level. We have door fixtures throughout the building that need new wiring. They don't stay, they don't stay open and they're connected to the fire alarm system. I mean, there's a whole list that Bob has given us that the, the, what we've gone, the route we've taken is we're chipping away and kind of working our way down the list and avoiding things as we go because they're too big of ticket priced items. So we have to make, if, you know, the committee has to make a decision. Um, do we continue the model of chipping away? Eventually, that bond is going to have to. We're going to have to go after a bond eventually, because eventually there's going to be things that are going to be too big to be broken. I mean, too big to be fixed within our our our, our budget. So, um, you know, you know, and that and that is a that's a whole kind of different presentation. But um, would a million dollars be enough to take care of all this? Stuff? I don't want to just throw a number out there. I think it's a different <clears throat> presentation. It oh, says no, if it's if I think if the committee says, sorry to take over here, but I think if the committee, but this is something I've been kind of watching and saying like we have to, we should get a bond out and we should get these things fixed instead of kind of you know again, if we want to go look at a bond, I think that we should go back, create a a full like uh, we talked about it before in one of our <coughs> meetings, a absolute need and then maybe a select need <coughs> and say what is the total price. And then get you that number of the total kind of estimate to go after your big bond. You know, and it's a big, I mean, we're talking about bonds and it's budget our size, a million is not a lot of money. You know, in, in the bigger scope of, you know, budgets and whatnot. Um, but you know. it really depends whether we're talking inside the, you know, because we, we, we do, we've got a lot of projects in the building, we've got projects out on the athletic fields and the, and, and the track. Got issues in the parking lot, so there is a lot of different maintenance here. I mean, we have a I mean, we have, that we need. To we have a light pole that got knocked out in the parking lot last winter. We haven't replaced that in the back parking lot. If you go the further way in the back, it's you know, these are all kind of things where it's like we don't. That's not where we want to put the money first because there's other issues that come before. It. And so these, I mean, there's a long list of these. Really shouldn't wait for brainstorming to take place on the rest of them because then you're going to miss the boat on doing any of this this summer. Correct. Correct. At least tier one and tier two. We, have, we, we must address those two. I'd just like to say that this is what we're looking at right now is the envelope of the building. Um, 
with the envelope yeah. with the library media. Yeah, center. well, uh, it essentially will grow yeah. to the yeah. envelope of the building yeah. if it's not looked at now. Right. Um, right. And then, like, the whole library media center restructuring, we have some kind of a donation, but that's all contingent on us doing this work first. Correct, Absolutely. I know in, in previous meetings we've talked about that. Um, I, right. I, it, uh, to I be, think that this is to, to clarify that the money is not contingent, but I'm not going to spend it's, you know forty thousand dollars on new furniture. It is contingent. You, you, you're well, gonna, I just said we yeah. we weren't going to spend it until we got to that point where we're protecting a buck. Um, so what are we going to do to do it all? Pardon me. What are we going to do to do it all? When you say when you say do it all, you're I not talking. You're talking more than six I'm, years. I'm, no, I'm talking this this. If, if we do everything right here. on this list, it's going to cost us about three hundred. Right. So how do we do that? I incur debt. I, <laughs> we'd have to incur debt. We only have one hundred and fifty-seven thousand dollars in R and D. Would you say so? If we vote to incur debt. Want. What is the procedure that we have to do to do that? I have to check with our attorney. With a bond proposal. Um, Would you? What's the, a, what's the difference between debt and a bond? Okay. Same thing. Let's different see, interest rate. If we vote to if we vote to incur the debt at the school committee meeting, then uh, the, it goes to the selectmen. The selectmen can either yeah, uh, not do anything, or they can allow it to happen. It triggers a process with them. They can either take it to a vote, or they can let it happen. We've got a time period. First thing you have to do is the, this body has to incur the debt. Then the selectmen can say, "I think we had a vote on it, and wait, or they." Can they can let it go. We notify four them of our intent to incur debt. We don't incur the debt in the three out of four times. I, think all, I just I don't think see why we're putting all this effort into figuring out what's wrong and what it's going to cost to fix, and then not diving in and fixing it if we can incur the debt. That's my point. I mean, how many times have you come to us with different varieties of yeah. this? On this Numerous. project, this is at Numerous. least the third time. Yeah. yeah. And. I just think we should do it. Let's do it. Get Sounds it like a motion. How long do you think the process would take to notify the selectmen of our intent to incur debt and then wait 30, they have 30 days? Oh, I think shorter period than that, Billy, if I'm correct. Yeah, I don't think it's 30. I, I want to say 15, somewhere in there, but I don't, I'd have to research the statute. But if we vote to incur the debt today and they send a letter to the selectmen of the four towns. We'll find out fast. That's true. I, I mean, I might uh, suggest that if, if we're going to try to go for bonding for the whole thing, that we still, at a very minimum, try to approve either four thousand, either the five thousand dollars for me to actually get the design done so I can bid the worst leak, mm -hmm. or or the full twenty-five thousand dollars so I can bid the worst leaks and get them done. What I wouldn't want to have happen is for us to go down the road of bonding and have that get tangled up and not happen this summer. Right. I think we can easily fix this worst major leak separate from the rest of the job. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if I can just have, you know. So I need a motion. Motion for to pay the twenty-five thousand dollars. I got a second. Well, motion. What? What he said. All right. Coming from where? Can we? Can we Which amend one, the motion what, what to say? The, it's four eight five seven plus eighteen thousand. To, to get everything put together and get it ready to, 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 to put out there and bid. It's the four eight five seven. And, and, and I need a total of twenty five thousand dollars to actually bid it and get the work done. So for two, for that, that, that would be the forty eight and the tier one. Pardon? The forty eight hundred and the tier one. Yes. That's twenty. That's Wait. not twenty five. It's just under twenty three. Can I just ask a twenty three three fifty seven? <laughs> Uh, a question. It seems that we're talking. We're, we're two different conversations going. We were talking no, about one's happening with the other. Okay. So it's all one. Yeah. But he's got to do something this summer. So stop me when I go wrong. If we do what we're doing this summer, then we can continue to do the rest. But if we wait and do it all, yeah. then he's not going to be able to do anything this summer. And if I don't do anything this summer, we're just going to continue to yeah. have leaks that are damaging. We need stuff. bigger buckets. Which are cheaper, more but not in the long run. More and bigger. Buckets. I think that's great. I just thought that 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 was the reason to incur debt, so that we could do it. Right. This summer, but, but we incur debt as we're fixing. Well, we don't, the, the, the process to incur debt would take us past summer. Oh, okay. 
that, that part I didn't understand. Right. The concern I have is to incur debt for three hundred thousand, then come back with another hundred and fifty thousand, and then come back with another hundred thousand within the next three years. Right. It makes, it, I, I don't, I, mean, I throw that out there to be discussed in the sense that it would make more sense to what are the biggest projects that we have already presented here, put those under one and say, okay, let's go after, I throw the word a million out there to not to scare people at home, but throw the word a million out there to say, you know, you 999,000 out there to say, you know, and, and handle all these things that we see coming down that are clear, not extravagant. We're talking about just, Again, <laughs> continuing what we have here and keeping it in good order. So, Patty, is there a way to swing the 25? Pardon? Is there a way we can swing the 25? Oh, you can take it out of the E and D at, uh, that's at, sitting at 157. That's not money that we promised to put against the budget. That's what's left. Oh, that's what's left. <clears throat> so, I'd like to second what uh, Bill's motion to take the 25. To take the 25 out of E and D. And we have a second, so we're still having to discuss <coughs> anything else. Discussion level. Well, I would suggest that we make it unanimous because of, because we have a limited number of people here today. Does anybody have a problem with it before we go? So it's twenty five thousand motion for twenty five thousand for tier one and final de design work. Phil and Bill made the motion. Yeah. It's slightly under twenty four thousand. It's twenty three three fifty seven. Give them some wiggle room. All right. All right. Good point. Good point. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Two thousand wiggle room. <laughs> So okay. what, 25 even then out of E and D? 25 even. 25 even. He has proven he does not overspend. Got it. Okay, all those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Get on the phone. And it starts. starts. <laughs> Let the games begin. So That's right. Out. Let the games begin. Right. Okay, so start. then you guys will start getting together some kind of yeah, death mm -hmm. type stuff for us. All righty. Uh, review and discuss the opinion letter from Dupree Law Offices. I read that. I like it. Can you go through it? Without page four? Yeah. How much money was this? $85,764.65. So, so we could use seven. that money to <laughs> fix the track? <coughs> That's what I was thinking. How much do you think to fix the track? <coughs> Hundred grand. <laughs> <laughs> well, the number that's in my long-range plan is one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, and that's based on the conversation with Mahar. That's you know, it, it's comparable kind of thing. If, if we totally fix the track, um, it would be about a hundred, I think, and, and that's not you know, that that's a guesstimate, but I think that's a, a, a fairly good guesstimate. And I also think that the only other thing we could do, you know, we've been spending for the last five years, we've been spending somewhere between $700 and $1,200 a year to have um, a company uh, out, out of the eastern part of the state come and do hatching. There are not a lot of companies in New England that do that. <coughs> There's only two companies, and I haven't been able to get the second one to respond to me at all. Um, with this, you know, we can keep catching away at it. The one thing Bob has said, and he's right about it, is a couple of companies <coughs> off the track that get really heavy traffic to pull that thing and that sort of thing right. are really not going to make it much longer. The question I have is. We need about thirty-five thousand more than what we have in a light account, correct? I guess. Yeah. Oh no, my math is fuzzy in my old age, right? Or is it forty? The light account, which you guys are discussing later, I mean, as we about to discuss now. Eighty-five thousand is in the light account. All right, so we need forty more from another source, mm -hmm. and we could ask. We have to ask early if we can get the forty thousand from the towns like they funded the work on the tennis courts where they took the money out of the CPA fund. I don't think a track counts as a, a community project. The tennis court the community uses a track not so much. Well, if people walk the track uh, uh, know, outside of school I, I hours for exercise. Was, I'm just saying it may be a stretch for Community Preservation Act. Don't ask me, don't get it. But if you, you know, the, most of the towns have 
sufficient. Uh, we just missed CPA all the meetings. annual town meetings. <laughs> I know, but I'm just saying, you know, it's not going to necessarily happen this summer to fix the track. You may have to wait till next spring. Well, I think that's the re that's the reasonable timeline. Is that is it? We know that the track will not get addressed this summer. Yeah, that's you know the idea is that we are probably a year behind where we should be on addressing the track, but you know right now it's limping through this this year. Um, I think we probably get another season out of it. And then after that, there's going to be the question of whether or not it's considered a safety issue. You know, without some kind of major repair. I, I'm just you know I think that I'm sure the you know so track coach is not going to be happy that I want to get another year out of it. But I think it's a realistic, if, especially if the plans are on the way. So if we go after the towns at their next spring's town meeting for it, we need to get yes or no, we'll get a no. Well, I think what my recommendation would be that we're going to come back to the next meeting with a um, everything that we would think that needs to be covered within a bond. Okay. okay? And then, of course, we would take up, we, if we can use that light money and we can apply that to lower the bond, I mean, we, we'll make it all transparent to show where it's at. But I think we should look at the other things because one could say, why do we care about a track when the boiler is going to go? You know, or why do we care about that when, sorry, when something else is going to go? And you start talking about priorities, you know, I think you need to see all the things before we start selectively how we're going to go back to the towns just because, you know, those kind of things. So it's not just, you know. I think you're right. I think I agree with you. Yep. Um, one of the other things I wanted to bring up, <clears throat> besides the email that Bob Smith sent me, um, I did uh, I did add the, the email in the packet. Yes. And I really am glad that we are talking about the track now because we do have over 120 students using the track. However, when we talk about the $85,000 from the light fund, I'm hearing, and I don't know if I'm correct, that the scoreboard for the football team needs to be replaced, mm -hmm. the goalposts, um, even if they just need to be scraped and painted, I'm understanding that the employees, our employees can't go that high, that there's you know limitations to how high they can go because of our liability, so to scrape and paint. So I don't know, and maybe Darius, you can help um, shed some light on the football uh, issue. Yeah, I mean, the goalposts we looked at, we had estimates that were crazy. The, the problem with the goalposts is the only real way to scrape and paint them is to take them down. And you've got to bring a crane out there and you've got to knock them in. By the time you're done with the labor involved with bringing a crane in, bringing them down, scraping and painting them, you're within a small percentage of buying new ones. Right. And then buying fiberglass that never even need to be painted again. So is that going to be included in our debt? I mean, we can, and then, yeah, right. I mean, that's the, I mean, there's a long list of other, I mean, that we're just talking about what's happening out there. And then we got stuff that's happening in, in the building, and then. In conjunction with the light, um, the money from oh, the, for the, the light, light yeah, yeah. fund, the $85,000. And, and so if we're looking at the light fund, which was meant to be spent somewhere on the athletic fields, we have a track in need of serious help. We also have these other issues that are similar to lights when you talk about a scoreboard. Although I don't know, do we need a new scoreboard? I, I mean, it's one of those things that's debatable. You know what I mean? It, it shows the score. You know what I mean? We also could tell the football team to start going for two instead of hitting field goals. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which they, they do 90% of the time anyways. Um, but you no, know, there is. The, the scoreboard, it needs to be addressed. But what's, you know, it's again, you get out there what's more important. If you're going to go after it all, then maybe include it. But I think we have to look at those, yeah. those prices and that's where it comes back to you guys to make decisions on where, where the, those kind of prior. I'll tell you where the, I will give my recommendation on where I think the priorities lie. But the, in the essence, the it's fund. I think the priorities line. is safety first. That's number Absolutely. one, and everything else comes second. Safety and continuing. I say safety first, and then continuing of current programs. So if you can't, don't replace the track, and we can no longer host track meets, then we're not continuing our programs. Right. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, we can still have a football game without a scoreboard. We can't have a track meet without the track. Right. But if you, you know what I mean? If you don't paint the goalposts, I think the ball still goes through when you kick it. I'm not sure. Of that. We also, true, we also, but they're getting pretty bad. <laughs> but we also, we also got a bucket truck that could be used that the four towns have. So they can't say they can't go up if they can go up in a bucket truck. No, our liability, no, our li our workers comp, I have to attest every year that they do not climb higher than seven feet, whether in a bucket truck Seriously? or, a, a, yes, that's our limitation on our workers comp. Wow. And higher above. Keith? 
I know this is not an answer, and that's not going to help you. You can volunteer, but we can't hire you. As a former coach, and every dime counts. There's out there. It's incumbent upon these teams to fundraise as well, and then what they can contribute in, in helping for these things. Okay, that has to be taken. So they have ownership. Thank you for saying that. And all four towns should be involved in doing so. So June, you're going to have some numbers for us. June, we're going to have some like doing a triangle here. Yeah, I mean we're we the it's Bob we're not we're not we're not making it from scratch. We've already have that list that exists. Right. As Bob just said to me, we will we will we will you know doll up the list and make it more presentable, and then be able to go through it and kind of um, put some of our priorities on that, and then bring it back to you to look at your priorities compared to our priorities and see where we go from there and see what makes the cut list. I think is the best way to kind of do it. Yes. So but meanwhile, we have the eighty-five thousand dollars. Back that the should ranch, be yes. spent out there. We knew we know we're going to have we're going to pr present a bond for the building, but now we have eighty five thousand dollars for out there. And I would just like to say I'm I'm a little concerned about the track, and I don't know how far eighty five thousand dollars would get us on the track if you so vote to use the money on the track. I think Mr. Lesko was saying that eighty five we. It, it, We've been spending twelve hundred. If we're going to do it, we got to go up to one hundred and twenty-five. So, yeah, you know, and then we don't want to spend the eighty-five, and then ha not have. Then you have to worry about what if the bond doesn't pass. And then we've already spent the eighty-five. So I think we have to do everything kind of in concert, <laughs> so that we can set our priorities based on funding. I guess the one thing there's only very few firms that do that kind of work. And anything I do to try to put a number on it. Really, a guess and, and change quite a bit. One of the things that could be thought about is um, I could try between now and the next meeting um, to talk to some firms you know, that design tracks and get some pricing for what it would cost to have someone come in and put a real this is what we're going to do. We're packaged together, but this is our plan. We take any information you can give us in whatever form you want to present it in. Did you have some, Bob? Yeah, I just want to make sure that, that Darius and Bob are going to come up with the financial information for what the costs are going to be. What we need to have the financial information about the correct procedures to, to incur the debt and the voting and stuff presented to us at the same time. I have written them. So that we can actually do it and uh, not make any mistakes. And if Sounds we need to, great. and if we need to contact uh, our uh, auditors to make sure we do it right, we should do that. Our are yeah. we going to are we going to table the mo on the light money right now? Are we going to table it yeah. and hold on to the money right now? We, took it under we don't have it under a vote. Okay. So we don't have to table anything. It was just discussion. Okay. So moving on. Okay, I got one question. Oops, sorry. Um, when was the last time that you took on a bond for major improvements to this building? 1998. So I'm going really close to. It was just paid off uh, a year ago. Yeah. When yeah. we when they built the new building in the front, tore down the other new auditorium. Twenty years ago. What's that? Twenty years ago. Yeah. Because we just finished it. Well, you, fi you paid it off early because you redid the financing right. nine years ago. I mean, nine years ago, mm -hmm. the May meeting, because I didn't make it. I and how did it get done? I got elected the day before. <laughs> okay. But I didn't make it. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Is that um, what you call it? So we're going to have discussion only of engaging in the process to change health insurance benefits by adapting, adopting, sorry, MGL 32B 21-23. Go for it. That is the, um, no, no, the letter you see to Allison Walters, mm -hmm. who is our uh, president right of our union. And that is, um, and correct me, if I say any, you know, if I don't get it right, but the the Hampshire County Group Insurance group in, the, the Hampshire County Group Insurance Trust has um, decided that all um, members of their health insurance units 
need to relook at in order to bring costs down. As you know, they went up 10% this year. To bring costs down, we need to look at, they want to look at deductions and co-pays. And we need to adopt this vote, which was, I think it was actually, this, uh, this law was, was actually put out there in 2010, and we, uh, we need to now adopt it so that we can be able to present, um, to be able to work with our union in December when we find out what the cost will be, so that in the school year 2019, when these savings are made by increasing deductions and co-pays, the union will get 25% of the savings from the first year. How was that? Does the union have anything to say? We have, um, we have to create a um, committee group that was requested. Yep. Um, the Insurance Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. um, the Public Employee Committee may not be something that we need to do right away as far as what the MTA has told me. Um, but for right now, we're going to be inquiring if people want to be on this committee. We know who we need to have as um, representatives, and we've got an annual meeting coming up in a couple of weeks that we'll be asking people to volunteer for that and then we'll notify the superintendent of the committee. And I'm waiting for further information from the MTA as well about this, because they're in touch with the trust, I guess. Yes, they are. It's happening all over, in the municipalities as well as the schools. Bob? Um, this has a lot to do with collective bargaining, mm -hmm. and my suggestion is before we make any changes, we need to have council involved and the business manager involved, and we need to talk she about is. it in the executive <laughs> session so that we all understand what the positives, what the negatives are, and what the long-term effect is going to be. And I really think that that should, needs to be done in an executive session, not in a yeah. open session. My understanding, Bob, is that um, we really don't have any choice. The, um, we need to adopt the law and then move with the Hampshire County Insurance. Uh, because if we don't, and we don't address the copay and the deductible, deductible we will um, we, may be. we may lose our um, seat at the table with the Hampshire County Insurance Trust. And Twice. so there's really um, there's really no question. Well, well, we could vote not to do it too. But then we'd be on our own and self-insured, and we don't want to go down that path. <clears throat> Are we getting bullied? No. Okay. I'm just Sorry. asking. Sounds like it. Yeah. Bit, but. I want to, you know, I'd like to see a comprehensive cost analysis of what we're talking about. We don't know, Bob. So let so let me let me back up. So Hampshire Group and Chicago Insurance Trust has over a five year period kept our rates pretty low, but the past two years, because they didn't have any additional reserves, we've taken two good hits. So Blue Cross and Blue Shield, who are our providers, have come to them and said, listen, if you want to keep these rates down next year, you need to talk about raising your copay and your deductibles. Okay, so that's what we're doing. So in order for them to do that, we need to adopt this legislation. And the, we have to negotiate with the union. But we have to adopt this by June. And then the piece, they will, they'll go out for the rates in December. So we don't know what the savings are till they go out for rates in December. So we can't talk about it now because we don't know. We won't know until <laughs> December what they can negotiate. Well, I do know that I get the, the GIC plan myself, and they've eliminated the deductible, okay? But they're now going to charge us $10 copay every time we go see the doctor. So Where is they, 15 so yeah, but, they're gonna, the but they, it's 10 for the retired state employees. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to say is, is the state's already moving to adopt more of the actual co-pays every time you go to the doctor. And, and that's we, what they want to do with us. They want our co-pays to go up and our deductibles to go up so that we can keep the rates down. But, but what I'm trying to say is, by voting this, I don't know that you're going to get out of that. Okay. What do you mean out of it? 
Okay. The rest of the trust has already adopted this. So they're asking all the communities who are in the trust to go to their select boards or their school committees and vote this so that we can talk about raising. In, in order for us to talk about and get possible rates, we have to adopt this legislation. And what are you hearing from the rest of them? <laughs> Hopefully, they're, they're I'm not hearing anything because they, they've given us May to present it and June to vote it. So until everybody votes it in June, we won't know. Bill? Motion to adopt. Oh, we're not voting till June. Oh. It's just brought I was just trying to short circuit this endless Thank conversation. Are we, are we going to have to go into. Um... <laughs> No, there's, the process is all legal. We can we'll, we can send you the email of what the process is tomorrow. No, I'm the same with the union. Do we have to? We yeah, know when, go. when we After get to we that point, point. Later. way later. So we have to adopt this. We don't have to go into executive session, and then afterwards when we negotiate, Correct. that may be on. The this board. is just allowing them to to see if the possibility is there to raise copays and deductibles. Okay. I guess. To keep the insurance rates down. Keep everyone's insurance rates down. Okay, moving along, um, discussion and vote to offer vision insurance to employees at 100% employee cost. So this was something that was brought to us um, by Hampshire Group Insurance Trust. We would go directly um, with to Blue Cross Blue Shield, and this is to offer vision insurance, which we don't currently have. We get a small discount through Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, for frames, um, and, ex and I don't think it's exams. I think it's frames and lenses. So um, what we, we would be recommending at 100% employee cost would be the integrated plan which means that every 24 months um, they could, employees could have an exam, which is fine because that's the same as our policy. Yeah. So you could actually get one a year going back and forth between the two policies. They could get new lenses every 12 months and new frames for every 24 months. Uh, it, by going directly with Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, the rates you see there, the 770, um, uh, the 1541, that would we'd actually save 10%. So it would be 693, 1386, 1318, and 2038. Um, Cope, this is um, the newest thing in insurance is the vision. A lot of people are wearing contact lenses. A lot of people are wearing glasses. A lot of people are getting bifocals, and it's getting more costly. So this would save our employees money, and it is 100% at their cost. How's the union feel about that? So we don't know if people are going to... I can't um, go to the membership until you authorize me to go to the membership to ask them if they want to participate. <laughs> you can't ask them if they want to participate before we... No, I cannot present this until it's approved by you guys. I, I checked with our attorney on this. Yes. Question. Uh, if we vote this, next time they go into collective bargaining, they're going to want peace, us to pay a piece of it. You know that. So. We're real tough, though. Um, we are? Yeah, we Why are. don't you read the contract you guys approved? Okay. So, okay. Anybody got anything else? Let's vote this. Motion. Let's talk about non-union. Yes, no. Motion. 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 Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Two people not. Neither one of you are one vote, so we're good. Unless you want Patty to do the math, just to be sure. I already shut my computer off, but... <laughs> Neither one of them or one vote, and I've got a one vote over there. Anybody else a one vote? One vote there, yeah, we're good. Okay, so it passed. Um, so um, all those opposed? Okay, we're good. Okay. Moving along, um, non-union salary recommendations. These are going to be voted on next week. I mean, next month, I apologize. Right. So we're going to be here? back again next week. Okay, so, so we're presenting this um, because last year it was handed to you and you expected to vote that night. So we wanted to give it to you early so you could look at it over the, um, over you know, until next month and then vote on it next month. What this represents is a 2% um, cost of living increase um, for everyone. That is non-union, except for me, of course. However, um, it mirrors what the unions, the uh, the CBAs, they received a, a one, a 2.5, and a 2.5 over three years. So it's six over three years. And my predecessor established 
um, kind of the same um, formula for the non-union people. Uh, they don't have bargaining uh, rights, but they 2%, 2%, and 2%. This also includes the confidential employees? <clears throat> it's, uh, everybody's confidential, no. Um, confidential employees? And some, I think you'll probably find you have some confidential employees, and you have some non-union employees. Is there a difference? No. I think we're all no, 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 no. Okay. Everyone is here that super is Super secret not. employees? The only one that's secret, super secret is that. <laughs> Not all the <laughs> um, can we have this format in June with the percentage that the staff is getting this year also? Instead Which, of just the two, two, and two. I know over three years they're getting six percent, but aren't they? You're not. They're not getting two percent this year. Two point five. Two point five. You're getting two and a half this year because yeah. we had one last year. Two and a half and two and a half. Did we do one last year? Yes. Probably did two. All right. Because it was decided um, after the budgets came out, mm -hmm. so everyone just kind of got warm. I was off here as a placeholder. I was and then it, yeah. This all money is what was in the budget. This is already in the budget. When we presented the budget, we have proposed non-union. These, these numbers match what's in the budget yes. because most years they don't, and I have to go up like a skyrocket. And if I don't have to do that, we really appreciate that. About that. This is in the budget. This there is we in go. the budget that you. we gave to the five. Um, at the five oh, different took me 40 years to get that, but I got it. Yes, definitely, it's already in there. Okay. Bill, you're going to be at the next meeting? <coughs> I don't know. Um, it could be more than one. Uh, review the summary report on the superintendent's performance evaluation. You were sent this by Donna today. Um, Kenny Cunningham and I met with the superintendent on Friday and went over both the Frontier and the Union 38, and in both she scored proficient, and by um, we did it out all in percentages. You can see it in the email, but um, she did say going forth that she wasn't going to have so many goals next year. And again, if you have any questions, Donna has a copy of all these things, but I wasn't, I didn't have available a copy machine, so I didn't want to use all my paper. So I asked Donna to send it to everybody. So it's available there. And I have it if somebody wants to look at it. So moving along. Um, Clavert is not here. Business manager is gone. Principal. Um, I passed out the report. I was, you know, the, the major highlight on that is I um, is graduation season. I'm inviting you all to graduation on um, June 2nd. Let me know if you're coming, if you want a special seat. Um, you will be there. Special you're not. You're. You're not um, just invited. You are required. <laughs> All right. And spring concerts are this week. I mean, you can kind of read through. And there's a long list of tons of stuff. I know people are tired. I heard so. your prom was wonderful. Prom was wonderful. So that's really cool. It was good. Fun. It was a rainy night, but it was a nice, nice location. Great food. Kids had a great time. Can I just say one thing? It's just right, a, right. another. Just a props out to the party <coughs> after graduation. Um, I don't know if anyone knows about, you guys know about the, the uh, party at the Greenfield YMCA that for students to go to and... Uh, you have one um, of those after the prom? I uh, know, it's after graduation. Oh. After graduation. Yes. After graduation. Yeah. That's coming up. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I, I do know because I've been wrangled in. I'll be there again from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. as a chaperone. Yeah, community service. Um, so, but it's an amazing opportunity for the kids to not be somewhere else getting drunk and, you know. Uh, or anything else that's Or anything else that can happen. <laughs> enough said. So, enough said. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Superintendent. Um, so my report you have, um, again, I became very ill. Um, and I just think the whole budget season was quite a bit. Um, but I'm okay. I've, I've got it all down to a science now. Much of the April was spent, it was dedicated to defending budgets. Our Frontier Regional School uh, budget was passed, and Robert Decker was re-elected to another three-year term. Congratulations. And I'd like to thank, thank everyone, all the, all the stakeholders and the community members who came out in support of our schools. Well, Lynn got re-elected, too. Lynn had to run this year? Yeah, she had to run. Congratulations to Well, Lynn and as hopefully well. Phil will get re-elected tomorrow? No, Thursday we will. Philip, mm -hmm. go vote. It's Thursday. Like Thursday. Chicago, vote early and vote often. I'm unopposed. I think I might win. 
Well, that <laughs> never <laughs> happened that way. So, <laughs> um, Girl, watch sorry. out for the right end. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you lose, you're in deep trouble. Just put it that way. We still have a report. Just have a little tiny thing I'd like to read because um, I actually sent it to all the teachers in the district. It is on my superintendent's message on the web page. And I would just like to read it for the folks at home. Last week was Teachers Appreciation Week, and I would like to take a moment to thank each and every one of our outstanding teachers who give of themselves to their students and to their profession every day to prepare our collective students to have a fulfilling and meaningful future. They are preparing our children to be balanced, global system systems, citizens in an increasingly internationalized, technology-driven, fast-changing world. They design learning experiences to guide our children to envision and plan for a future they will not only live in, but a future they can change because they will have the tools. At the end of the day, this is what the school committee is here for, this is what the community expects, and this is what the taxpayers support. But it all comes together behind a magic door where our gifted and wonderful teachers work with our most important resource, our children. They are the core of everything we do. Thank you, teachers, for all your hard work. And thank you. You too, Cindy. Yes. Well, as a teacher? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I see you tonight for 10th grade. Go ahead. One thing I just wanted to note that uh, one of our former members, uh, Billy probably served with him because he's been here a long time, but Bobby Sanderson died a week or so ago. I saw him. And he was uh, a member of the Frontier Board for many, many years. His son died. Marty. Marty is uh, the athletic director. Right. But, but Bobby served for many, many years on, on the Frontier Board, so I just wanted to make note of that. So. Do we send a condolence card in such a situation? We do not usually. We can, but we do not usually. I can. Do you want to? No, I'm It's I, just but, trying to keep track of everything that's going on. Yeah, but when something. We're trying to be rude and crude. No, I know, but, but you should. Uh, I can take that. Okay. That would be great. That would be great. Um, and thank you for putting up with Michael tonight. And Lynn and I are trying to yeah. decide who's sticker. Yeah, um, I had to actually leave the room three times. I think I. I think you might have it tonight. I think so. But that that's a big that. We'll be sure. Or some special yeah. deal. Yeah, right. I know. I know. I know. Um, Bob, uh, Bill already made that, so you have second to second it. it. All those in favor? Shut the camera.